Okay, Eric, we're live. Hello and welcome. Um, if you're joining us on Zoom, if you're joining us on YouTube or Facebook, um, you know, we are really excited here. Um, to have another partnership series or episode of this series with Chabot Space and Science Center and SETI. Um, my name is Eric Kavanaugh. I'm the membership manager over here at Chabot and Space and Science Center. And we're really thrilled to bringing you another exciting program um, to your homes this evening. Um, so when most people think of aliens, they figure that they're probably little gray guys, green guys with big eyes and no hair, and they never smile. After all, that's what you see on TV and in the movies. But as scientists seek evidence of real aliens, um, you know, it's kind of awesome to, to, to hear about all this stuff. Tonight we have um, with us from SETI an astronomer, Dr. Seth Shostek. Hope I did that right. Um, and he will be talking to us about aliens. Um, but I wanted to pass it over to uh, my new colleague, Simon Steele from SETI, and to talk about SETI. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, very exciting to be here. My name is Simon Steele. I'm the Director of Education and Outreach at the SETI Institute down in Mountain View. Um, it's great to do another evening event with our friends across the Bay at Chabot. This is the second of, we hope, a very long series of, of science talks for families. Um, the SETI Institute is a nonprofit research center. Uh, it has over 100 scientists dedicated to the search for life in the universe in all its forms, uh, for everything from uh, microbes on Mars to advanced alien civilizations and uh, one of the scientists leading the, the top end of that scale of life is uh, Seth, who will be talking about uh, alien life and intelligent alien life. If you wanna know more about the SETI Institute and its research, please do go onto our website, uh, www.seti.org, and you'll be able to look up all of the research and everything that's happening. And uh, we have a lot of news items that will help you keep uh, up to date with the search for life in all its forms. Um, as I said, this is the second of uh, monthly talks we do in conjunction with, with Chabot. There'll be another one in October. And uh, again, check out our website for other live presentations that the SETI Institute is doing. So uh, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it back to Eric um, and we can get on to talking about aliens. Yeah, so yeah, um, if you're, if you're a member or if you're um, tuning in through our uh, uh, Chabot Facebook, um, we will definitely have these on our events page, ChabotSpace.org. Um, thanks, Simon. And thank you, everyone from SETI for this second episode and for this awesome collaboration. I know that it brings me so much excitement during this time of just working um, at Chabot during this. So. Um, Dr. Shostek claims to have developed an interest in extraterrestrial life at the tender age of 10 um, when he first picked up a book about the solar system. Uh, this incident, uh, this innocent beginning eventually led to degree in radio astronomy and now as senior astronomer, Seth is an enthusiast enthusiastic participant in the institution, Institute's SETI observing programs. In addition, Seth is keen on outreach activities, interesting, interesting the public and especially young people in science in general and astrobiology in particular. He's a co-authored a college textbook on astrobiology and has written three trade books on SETI uh, in addition, he's published more than 400 popular articles on science, including regular contributions to NBC News, Mock, uh, gives many dozens of talks annually, and is the host of the SETI Institute's weekly science radio show, The Big Picture. So don't forget to check that out. Um, don't forget, if you do have questions, 
Um, we will, we would like to save them for the end so we can kind of get through through this. And then um, I think we're going to try, if you're on Zoom, we're going to try to do some polls. So stay tuned for that while we're doing that. But please try to use the Q&A um, in, the, in the Zoom um, if you can, so we can stack those up. And if you are on Facebook or YouTube, um, go ahead and type those in and those questions will get to us on the Zoom link as well, so we can um, get all those questions answered, or as many as we can. So here we go. Um, Dr. Shostek, take it away. All right, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, that looks like you. Uh, thanks very much, Eric. By the way, the name of the show is Big Picture Science. I uh, commend it to you if you can you can hear it on KALW from across the bay, or you can just go to the web and, and uh, look at it there. Do we have any kids in the audience? Are there any kids out there? I don't hear any. Okay, well, maybe there aren't, and I hope so, because this, uh, this talk is going to be at a uh, kid level. Hang on. Wait, I'm trying to share the screen here. Okay, uh, the title of the talk is What Will Aliens Look Like? And so we're gonna talk a little bit about that, but before we get into that, I'd like to mention that uh, there are some questions that Eric's going to read out to you. There are multiple choice answers for those questions. There are three questions. He'll read them to you, and you think about them. We'll give the answers at the end. And the winner will get an all-expense paid vacation for six to Emeryville. So uh, I, well, why don't you read those questions, Eric? All right. Oh. I got it. So the first question, approximately... How many Americans believe that some UFOs might be alien craft? Ooh. One million, a hundred million, or all Americans? And it looks like the poll is saying a hundred million. Oh, they've already answered the poll? That's well, history. yeah, I can. It's coming in and it's giving. So, seventy percent of of everybody on the Zoom right now is saying a hundred million. Okay. Well, we we can't afford motel reservations for all that pe many of people in Emeryville, but that is the correct answer. It's about a third. All right. Try the next one, Eric. Um, the next question. Uh, oh, it looks like the same. Okay. There we go. Question. Is this a new one? No. Approximately how many Americans believe that some UFOs might be alien spacecraft? That's the same question. Oh. Let's see. Looks like someone's trying to get me the next question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. Question number two. Have scientists ever heard signal from space that has been sent by aliens? And the, the possible answers are yes, but only okay, once. Yes, but only once. Yes, several times, but we couldn't understand it or no. Uh, let's see, on our Zoom, we're trending to no. That's a smart audience. I'm going to have to replace all my slides. Okay, go to, go to question three there. Let me, that's getting pulled up. Question three about how many planets exist in our galaxy according to scientists? A trillion, a million, or 4,000? We are trending to number one, a trillion. Well, that's right. Okay, well, all you people um, just get in touch with Chapeau and they will mail to you uh, transportation from wherever you live, as long as it's very close to Emeryville, and uh, you know to to attend this <laughs> the winners event, and there will be there will be snacks. All right, I'm going to try this again here um, to share the screen. Okay, and give it a click. Okay. Do people can see that? Can can you uh, it, can people see that? Um, I definitely can. Okay. All right. Good. All right. So here it is. What will the aliens look like? Now, this is not an alien. 
Uh, this is actually a guy that I photographed on the streets of Mountain View. Uh, he was looking for the way to Sunnyvale. But anyhow, we will talk a little bit about what aliens will look like after discussing with you, you know, why do we even think there are any aliens? Okay. Well, to begin with, there's just a lot of real estate. There's a lot of place for the aliens to be. Now, if you go out at night, maybe in Oakland, you know, look up at the night sky, you might see three stars. <laughs> I mean, if there are no clouds, you might see three. If you went to someplace a little darker, like the Sierra, then you might see a couple of hundred, even a few thousand. If you have a telescope, of course, you can do much better. This is a Hubble photo of a, what's called a globular cluster. doesn't really matter. But the point is, we have a good idea now of how many stars are out there in all the universe that we can possibly see. And that number is this. It's obviously a big number. It's uh, one followed by 22 zeros. Now, that's, that's a lot of stars. But of course, ET is probably not going to be on a star unless you know he's made of uh, asbestos and even then. So the question is, what about planets? Well, you all know about planets. I mean, you probably studied them. Now, here are some photos made of planets by spacecraft. These are the planets in our own solar system. And uh, you know, these photos maybe don't strike you as particularly remarkable, but they do to me. Because when I was a kid, just before they invented paper, when I was a kid, we didn't have space photos of any of these places. The only photos we had would show most of these places just as dots. Venus was just a bright crescent. Mercury was kind of like a dot. Mars was a little bit better. Jupiter a little better. Saturn, you could see the rings, nothing else. Anyhow, this is a tremendous difference in just one lifetime, OK? How much we know about our own solar system. And by the way, there are like seven places in this solar system where there could be life. I mean, you know, you're not going to see Martians walking around, but there might be microbes underneath the surface of Mars and might be microbes in the clouds of Venus, as you heard two weeks ago, stuff like that. So even our own solar system might have other life, but probably need a microscope to see it. But what about other planets where there might be real aliens, the kind that could talk to you, right? Well, we found a lot of planets around other stars, and that's also a very remarkable thing. Because again, when I was a kid, you go to the planetarium, and the planetarium presenter would say, well, I mean, we don't know. Uh, there might be planets out there. We think there probably are. It seems reasonable. It's a good guess, et cetera. But they didn't really know. And some of them said, mm, probably there aren't any planets. Well, we found, this is uh, just a, an artist's rendition of some of the planets we found around other stars. There are you know, more than 4,000 of them. But that's not really what's so interesting. What's interesting is that almost every star has a planet. That's something we know now something we didn't know even 20 years ago. So that's great. It sounds like there are a lot of places where there might be aliens. So our question might actually make some sense in, 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 in this way, that if you have all those planets, a trillion, just in our Milky Way, as uh, was, uh, that was question number two, I believe, a trillion in our Milky Way, and we can see a trillion other galaxies, each with a trillion planet, that's a really large number of planets. They're not, they're not going to fit in the glove compartment of your car, right? There are a lot of planets out there. So with lots of planets, some of them will cook up life, and some of those may produce intelligence. So if we want to know what's behind the microphone, you know, fair to ask. I mean, it might be this guy. All right. But I say it's fair to ask because I think it's sort of an interesting question. But does it matter to science? Do we really care, right? We're trying to pick up ET on the radio. That's one of the big experiments at the SETI Institute. We have big antennas and some very sophisticated receiving equipment. We're trying to eavesdrop on, on signals that might be coming to us. Uh, but you could say, all right, well, that's good. That's interesting. It would prove there are aliens out there. But what do I care what they look like? I, mean, I don't care, right? You tune in your favorite uh, DJ here, your favorite news reader, your favorite talk show host on your car radio, like this person here is doing. Do you really care what they look like? I mean, you might, but it's, it's not so important. You're interested in what they're saying. You're interested in the fact you can tune them in, but you don't really care what they look like. And that sounds like that would be the answer also for the scientists. You know, they're just building more equipment to try and find the signal without worrying too much about who might be behind it. But by the end of this talk, which should be, I don't know, two in the morning, by the time that we finish this talk, I hope that you'll realize that it might make some difference what ET is like. Okay, 
And in any case, what E.T. is like certainly matters to Hollywood. Uh, here's a, a guy from Central Casting. This is kind of a common alien. You'll notice a couple of things about this alien, other than the fact that all his freckles are between his eyes, that he has five digits. In other words, he has a thumb and four fingers, just like most of you, right? That's kind of interesting because that was an accident, right? I mean, it didn't have to be that. It could, could have been six fingers or four fingers. I mean, Mickey Mouse only has four, right? You have five. Now, that's kind of an accident, but you see, once again here, something that you'll see again and again and again during this tedious presentation, namely that we tend to think of ET as being somewhat like us, okay? Now, uh, here's, a, here's, here's ET himself. And of course, this little ET, aside from having the glowing finger, uh, which is helpful if you have to get up at night, you know, to go to the bathroom or something, at least you don't need a nightlight, you can just use your finger there. But this guy, you know, he was a good alien. He had big eyes, a short nose, a wrinkly face. He's just like a kid, right? And that's what he did. He came to Earth, and in the end, he just spent all his time playing with the kids. Okay, so that's a friendly alien, but most aliens are not so friendly. This is a scene from a movie I hope none of you have seen called Battle Los Angeles. And for those of you who are familiar with Southern California, you may notice that uh, that's, I think there's Santa Monica Pier down there, although it seems to be flipped. But in any case, that's the, and the aliens who are responsible for all this uh, artillery coming in are just trying to flatten Los Angeles. Now, I was actually uh, involved in the publicity for this film. I'm not quite sure why, but I was. And they, they flew me down to, uh, well, Santa Monica, and I stayed at the, one of the hotels you can actually see in this photo and uh, watched the film. And I have to say, it didn't trouble me that the aliens had come all this way to flatten Los Angeles, because I live in Northern California, and frankly, flattening Los Angeles would provide a lot of additional parking space for when I go down there. So it wasn't such a problem. But these were clearly evil aliens. They come to Earth, and what do they do? They flatten our cities, right? So those kinds of aliens have to be ugly, right? Just like the bad guys in the movies. This is a movie bad guy. Can't remember his name, but whatever it was, it was probably an ugly name too. Here he is in a Western, and <laughs> you can tell he's a bad guy. All you have to do is look at him, let alone the way he dresses, right? So the idea that Hollywood has of most aliens, who are, after all, pretty nasty, is that they're probably going to be ugly. So, uh, you know, for a long time, of course, the ugly ones were, had to be kind of simple. Here's some, uh, <laughs> some aliens from Star Trek. Now, you know, the thing about these guys is, well, it was dictated by the fact that Star Trek was a very low-budget television show. So these guys are just, you know, these are Halloween masks. I mean, if there were real aliens like this, right, to begin with, most of them could be fixed to look more like you by just sending them to a plastic surgeon. The other thing that's interesting is that if one of these guys moved in next door, right, I mean, you might talk about them for a while, but eventually you'd probably invite them over for, you know, cookies and milk, right, because they don't really look all that much different from you. I mean, I, I suppose you think they do, but I mean, compared to a fish, these guys look pretty much like you. But that was dictated by the budgetary considerations. The fact they couldn't spend a lot of money to make these aliens, so they just put, you know, masks and makeup on uh, cheap actors. Okay, but now that we have computer animation, the aliens have gotten a little more imaginative. So here are some bad aliens, uh, and you can tell they're bad aliens because they're not terribly attractive. I mean, a guy, <laughs> both of these guys, but probably would be a godsend for, for dentists because it looks like they need a lot of work. But uh, a couple of things to note even here, right? You notice they all have two eyes. Interesting. They have two eyes, just like you. Uh, you know, there's spiders that have five eyes, and there's, there's some that have even more. But you have two eyes, just like these aliens, so you share something in common with them. But, you know, ugly aliens, that, that may be what Hollywood thinks they'd be like because after all, they come from another world and consequently they're going to be ugly to us. Well, here are some aliens. These are, <laughs> these are not people, these are not humans, but they're all earthlings. They all have DNA. They all share the planet with you. And I don't think you would say that they're ugly. They're not ugly, they're kind of cute too, right? Okay, so, so there's no reason that the aliens could be cute, right? It's, it's, it's just a consequence of what their intentions are. The fact that they're here to 
you know, wreak havoc and destruction means they're probably going to be ugly. But that's Hollywood. Not science, it's Hollywood. Okay. So maybe they won't be ugly. Maybe they'll just be sort of strange, like, like this guy. Okay, here's your standard alien. Uh, actually, this guy <laughs> lives uh, at the SETI Institute on the desk of Mr. Lee. And uh, he, was, he was sent to us by the manufacturers. It turns out the manufacturers were not aliens uh, because they thought we could sell any of these. So if anybody you know, would like to fund the future research of the Institute and get this alien in return, please let us know. All right, here's a Zork, standard alien. Now, there are some other things you might be able to say about aliens other than whether they're gonna be attractive or unattractive. There are some very simple engineering considerations. This guy here is obviously not an alien, this is a human, and you notice he has something that you probably don't think about very much. He has a head, all right? And, and, and you might notice that an awful lot of animals have heads, right? Why should they have heads? I mean, you know, cabbage plants don't, well, I guess they do they have heads of cabbage, but I mean, you know, most plants don't seem to have heads, but almost all animals do because there's an advantage in getting your eyes, your nose, your ears, even your mouth up front where you're going, because that way you can see where you're going. And if it's on the top of your head, if you can stand up, right, those eyes allow you to see over the grass, which would have been important a long time ago when a lot of us lived in places where there was a lot of grass, okay? Uh, <laughs> not, I'm, I'm not talking about the hate. Okay, so these guys could see over the grass, right? If your, your eyes were in your kneecaps, well, not so much right? And you probably wouldn't be able to catch dinner because you would never see it, and something else might catch you. So that may sound kind of trivial, but the fact that we have heads is not so trivial. That's actually an interesting thing, and maybe E.T. will have heads. They do in the movies, but would they in reality? Probably yes. And by the way, I've already mentioned these guys have, well, the ones we've looked at have two eyes, just like us. Now, they don't have to have two eyes. You could have one eye, you could have five eyes. You could have eyes in the back of your head. You probably haven't thought about that, but that might be somewhat advantageous to you. If you had an eye in the back of your head, you might be able to see a predator sneaking up on you, right? And yet we don't have eyes in the back of our head. And it isn't because there's all that hair there because you could you know, sort of part the hair. It's because apparently it would take too much brain power to process vision from two directions and three eyes or four eyes. So we have two eyes in the front and we have a neck that allows us to turn around a little bit. Two eyes are also important when they overlap like this. In other words, they're both looking in the same direction. Not like a horse, you got an eye on one side and an eye on the other side, right? So they can't really see in 3D very well, but we can because we have these two eyes. And again, if you're a predator kind of critter and uh, humans are at least partially predators, it's good to have 3D vision because then you can judge how far away that needle is that you're trying to catch. So, you know, given that uh, ET might be also omnivorous, maybe they have uh, two eyes. One eye is very useful. Almost all critters have some sort of eye. Two eyes are better. You can see 3D. All right. Now, here's something, uh, well, I, I don't know if you thought about it. The fact that you have two arms and two legs. In other words, you have four limbs, just like this, this guy, uh, Tiktaalik, uh, who lived quite a while ago, 375 million years ago. I, I was just a teenager then. 375 million years ago, this guy was living in the oceans. And our, you know, uh, his descendants include you and me. The fact that he had four limbs, two rear flippers, or whatever you want to call them, they're, they're called pods, but it just means feet, and two in the front. He's a tetrapod, he has four feet. And we're derivative from these guys. We've descended from these guys, and that's why we have two arms and two legs. It didn't have to be that way. We could have had two arms and four legs, or four arms and two legs that help you play piano duets with yourself, right? But we have two and two. And that's kind of just an accident of evolution, that it's four in total. And it all goes back to this guy here. So you can thank him for the fact that we have two arms and two legs. We also have opposable thumbs. And those sound like uh, some sort of political statement, but it's not. Opposable thumbs, you know, not every critter has these sorts of things that allow you to grab stuff and to also to use tools and all the things that are important if you're going to design, you know, websites or uh, video games or stuff like that. 
That opposable thumb is what allowed us to develop a lot of tools. So it's a really important thing. And we, we had them originally, not for you know assembling iPhones, but we had them originally so that we could climb around in the trees because you know our direct ancestors uh, were arboreal, which means they lived in the trees. So it was important for them to be able to grab branches and stuff like that. But the consequence for you is you can use tools. You can use a you know, pair of pliers or a soldering iron or something like that. So that's a good thing. Would ET have an opposable thumb? Well, if we find ET, that means they're able to build big radio transmitters so we can hear them. And if they can do that, they have to use a soldering iron. And that means that they might very well have an opposable thumb. Now, uh, the daughter of Lily, who is on this call here, asked, well, how big would ET be? Could they be giant or could they be small? And of course we don't know because we haven't found them yet, but in some sci-fi stories, uh, sometimes the aliens are very small and sometimes they're very big, but there may be a problem there. I mean, very small. Now this, this little alien here, he has a head the size of a ping pong ball, okay? And you might think, well, okay, so what? Well, the so what is, if your head's that small, it can't hold too many neurons, which are the kind of little cells that are used as the basic building blocks of a, of a brain. So his brain's going to be small. And if his brain is small, he's probably not clever enough to build a radio transmitter. He's not intelligent. He might be great for zipping around on, you know, on the forest floor and picking up nuts and stuff like that, but it might not be very clever. Now you might say, oh, yeah, well, how can you say that? Because maybe they have tinier neurons than we do. And maybe. But in fact, it turns out that neurons for all animals on Earth are about the same size. So that doesn't mean you couldn't build a smaller neuron, but there is some limit. So it's unlikely that ET would be about as tall as, I don't know, a, a soda, soda can or something like that. Probably not. Now, what about at the other end? Maybe they could just be giant. And sometimes in the movies, they are. Uh, here, <laughs> here you see this unfortunate couple here uh, contemplating this guy who apparently was wearing a parachute and just drop down onto the landscape here. And uh, you can see that he's twice as tall as the humans are, more than twice as tall, okay? He seems to be friendly, at least in this shot. In the next shot, of course, he stepped on these two people and that's the end of them. Now, the, uh, there, there are a couple of things here. One, he only has one eyeball. We've already talked about that. And it's a pretty big one too. You can imagine the cost of contact lenses for this guy. But that one eyeball means he doesn't have very good 3D vision. So maybe he can't tell how far away those humans are. Uh, but he once again has, you know, five digits, a thumb and four fingers, probably the same with his toes, so you can't see them. But he's very tall. Now, if you make something very tall, right, may, maybe as this guy, he's twice as tall as those humans. He's 12 feet tall instead of six feet tall. And that means he's 12 feet tall, but he's also twice as wide as the humans and twice as deep as the humans. So he's two times two times two, which is eight times heavier, right? His weight would be eight times the weight of that guy down there on the left. But he's not eight times stronger because it turns out that the strength of your muscles depends on their, what's called cross-section. But it, what it means is that while he may be eight times heavier, he's only four times stronger. So that's why this guy probably couldn't stand up very easily. <laughs> he wouldn't have enough strength to do very much. Okay. By the way, the other direction, it works great. You, if you're only half as high, you know, uh, your muscles are only a fourth as, as uh, powerful, but on the other hand, you're eight times lighter. So if you're really small, you can do all sorts of nifty stuff that wouldn't be uh, uh, something that humans can do, like, you know, ants can carry the, more than their own weight on their backs and stuff like that, okay? Or you can just drop a kitten from, you know, five feet up and uh, it doesn't seem to matter. Okay. That has a consequence. So here's some aliens from a film very few of you may have seen, and if you have seen it, you probably regret it. This is from the film made by Dutch uh, director Paul Verhoeven called Starship Troopers. And the troopers are on the left there, and the aliens here, well, clearly on the right. Now, you notice he doesn't have opposable thumbs, so he kind of interesting how he built a spacecraft, but whatever. The thing about this guy is he's just a scaled up bug. It's like a bug. And they made the bug about 100 times taller than a real bug would be, an act, you know, a human kind of bug. But if he's 100 times taller, 
that means he's 100 times 100 times 100. He's a million times heavier than a bug, <laughs> but, but he's only you know, 10,000 times stronger than a bug. So in fact, if you really had an alien like this and he was built like bugs are built, he wouldn't be able to support his own weight. Whoops. And he would crush, he would collapse into a big mess uh, that uh, you know, a lot of uh, rodents would love to eat. Okay, having said all that, having considered all these engineering consider, uh, you know, consequences that would apply to any alien, you might decide that, well, gosh darn it, Seth. I mean, you know, they can't be too tall and they can't be too short. And they can't be too heavy and they can't be too light. And they gotta have two eyes and the eyes gotta be in the head and the head's gotta be on top of their body. Michael, it sounds like us, which it does, uh, but it doesn't mean they really look like us, right? I mean, you know, go to the zoo, they, 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 the giraffes and rhinos and fish and snakes and all that stuff. And they don't look like you and they share the planet with you, right? Nonetheless, this guy, Simon Conway Morris, he's a very clever and a very droll guy at uh, Cambridge University in England. Uh, he thinks that we are probably the best design for an intelligent being. And consequently, the aliens will look pretty much like humans. Now, I don't particularly share that idea, but I mean, you could argue it, and he does in some books. I mean, he thinks that if the aliens look like this, I mean, this guy, you see there, if he walked into Macy's tonight to buy a suit, it would fit him. I mean, if, right? <laughs> he's so much like a human. So, you know, maybe until we find the aliens, we're, we're not sure that they look like us. I, I think it's unlikely, but, you know, don't know till we find them. All right. Now, let me just go on to one last thought about all this. And uh, this, this will only take about an hour and 30 minutes. Uh, we assume that you're a standard alien like this guy who by the way, never tells jokes. This guy here, um, we assume that these aliens, if you opened them up, you would find that they have some sort of squishy insides, you know, some sort of organs and cells and blood, and who knows what. Might not look like your organs or your blood or anything like that, but they got all that stuff because after all, they're alive. They're biological, okay? But this plot, which I just love so much, I show in every talk I give, even when it's about, you know, uh, tourists travel to Hawaii or whatever, but shows how computers are getting more and more capable with time. This is called Moore's Law. This, this law was cooked up here in the Silicon Valley. Anyhow, let's plot here. These little red dots are the speed, if you will, of a computer that you could buy for $1,000 in 1960, 70, 80, and so forth. Now, the guy who made this plot, uh, Hans Morovich, who's at the Carnegie Mellon Institute, for those of you who want to write him, uh, he stopped the plot in about what, 2003 or something. And for $1,000, you could go down to prize and buy a computer that has the compute power of a lizard, right? I mean, that's not terribly interesting unless you want to, you know, <laughs> send email to other lizards. But if you go to 2020 and you look up here, well, what does $1,000 buy you? Well, maybe a monkey or maybe even a human equivalent in intelligence, all right? So that's what we're doing with computers. They're getting faster and faster and faster and faster. They're getting better so fast that if your laptop is more than four years old, you know, you have to petition your parents to get you a new one because yours are just so antiquated. It would be like you, you know, getting a ride to school on a horse. It's time that they moved on. Okay. Now, just to show you the state of this, uh, of this technology again, here's a resident of Oakland. This is the speed at which a human brain is estimated to run. I mean, this, this number is, you know, uncertain by factors of two or three, but, you know, I'm an astronomer, who cares about two or three? 30 million, sorry, 30 billion, million instructions per second. That's what the human brain runs at. You might hardly believe that of the kids sitting next to you, but it is true. Nonetheless, there are computers, and this one is in China, the Tianhe 2, which goes at the same speed, in fact, even a little faster, right? Now, the thing about this computer is, you know, you couldn't get it into a school seat, because it's a, a little too big for that. A brain is nice and compact, but in principle, it could do all the thinking that a brain this size could make, or could do, right? Okay, well, maybe not, because we don't know how to give this computer the instructions necessary to do what a human brain does, but at least the hardware is there. And that's only gonna become more and more the case as we move to the future. So while you're thinking, that the aliens are gonna be guys like these, <laughs> no whites in their eyes. Uh, and, um, you know, can you imagine the bill for their hats? 
it's going to be like this. But that's just not true. It's not going to be guys like this. The really advanced aliens will have invented thinking machines. And one of the big benefits of thinking machines is, well, to begin with, they don't die. You know, unless the hard drive does. They don't die. But the, the really big advantage is that the next generation machines can be smarter because you can use those machines to design the next generation of machines. And that's not quite so true of humans, right? We don't design our babies yet. And even if you did, they probably wouldn't be smarter than the ones that the, you know, they came from, right? So that's a big advantage of machines. The other big advantage of machines is they don't have to stay on a planet because they don't need, you know, water and air and and all the stuff we have, you know, food and all the stuff we have on a planet. They need some energy, you know, you know some material for spare parts, but that's about it. So uh, I, I think that thinking of ET like these guys, while fun, is maybe missing the boat. That ET is more like this guy, whatever this guy is. It's just a lot of information hardware, okay? And it doesn't have to stay on a planet. So, um, you know, I guess that the bottom line is this. The universe is big. This is a photo made by the Hubble uh, Space Telescope not too long ago. This is called the Hubble Deep Field. But all it is is they pointed the telescope at a tiny, tiny patch of sky and exposed for more than 100 hours, which is a long time exposure. And you can see there's a, you know, there's a star there and there are a couple of stars elsewhere. There's one down here in the lower right. But everything else here is a galaxy. Those are all galaxies, all those little blotches of light. Each one of those has a trillion planets. A trillion planets in each one of these, and this is only a tiny bit of the sky. So it's pretty sure, I mean, it seems like a pretty safe bet that we have a lot of cosmic company, and some of it's going to be smart, but it just might not be soft and squishy. Okay, that's enough for all this. I'm going to see if we can. Yes, okay. So I guess for the three of you who still are in the audience, maybe we can go to uh, questions. Yeah, I got some for you, Seth. Um, the first one that came early was, um, does Mercury have an atmosphere? Well, not really. It's very small. And as a consequence, it doesn't have enough gravity to hold on to an atmosphere. Now, it has to be said that if you look very, very carefully, you find that you know, even the moon has an atmosphere, but, but you can't breathe it. It's so very, very thin. And again, it's because the moon, well, there are a lot of reasons in the case of the moon. But in the case of Mercury, it's, it's just too small to hold on to any atmosphere. You know, the gases of the atmosphere just boil off into space eventually, and uh, so it's long gone. So if you go to Mercury, if you're going to Mercury this weekend, bring your own air. <laughs> um, another question from Rihanna. Uh, some scientists say that aliens could not live in some of the planets in the solar system because of lack of water, no sunlight, too much sunlight, etc. Um, it's a two-part question, but why and why do they have to need those things just because we do? Yeah, well, they don't. That's the point. But if you have any kind of critter that you'll see in the zoo, for example, those are animals that are very closely related to us in almost all cases. And they have all developed uh, in, in, uh, on a planet where there was a lot of oxygen. You know, we've had a lot of oxygen in the atmosphere for about 2 billion years. And all those, all those critters are less than 2 billion years old. So, uh, you know, in terms of their evolutionary uh, history. So, you know, they all want to breathe oxygen. They all need water to survive and so forth and so on. But microbes, you know, little, uh, bacteria and so forth, they're really tough. I mean, they can live in all sorts of conditions. They can live inside nuclear reactors. They can live inside the, the fuel tanks of jet aircraft. I mean, they can, they can live in places that you would not want to live, even in places where the, the, uh, the water might be boiling. They, they can still, some of them can still tough it out. So if you're going to look for life in our solar system, for example, in the clouds of Venus, you would not like living in the clouds of Venus and yet there's some indication that there may be life in the clouds of Venus, but it would be these kind of extreme bacteria, these, these bacteria that can live in conditions that are not good for you. Okay. Oh, we have a seven-year-old out there, Samad, 
um, why doesn't space have atmosphere? Yeah, well, <laughs> the trouble is the gas won't hang around. The air won't hang around, right? Uh, because the air, you know, if you if you were to, well, let's see, how can you describe this? The, the, the thing is something has to keep the air from just wafting into the space, all the air on the planet Earth, which isn't, by the way, all that much. It's enough for us. But if it all, you know, it decided to, to boil away into space tomorrow and just evaporate, if you will, uh, you know, it wouldn't fill up space with very much air because space is really big and the Earth is relatively small. But the, that, that's basically why, because there's nothing to hold it down, to hold it in place in space. And besides, it would take an enormous amount of oxygen and nitrogen and all the things that are in our air to uh, fill up all of space. I mean, uh, somebody would have to make all that, they had to make all that stuff and, and, and put it into space. And most of those uh, elements, by the way, have been cooked up in stars and they cook up a lot of it, but it's not enough to fill space with a really thick atmosphere. Now, having said that, just you know, so I don't get yelled at by the astronomers, it's true that there is a gas in space, but it's very, very thin. In fact, it's more of a vacuum than the best vacuum you can make in a laboratory here on Earth. And yet it's there. And uh, in fact, with the right kind of telescopes, you can find those gases in space. So there is a little bit of hydrogen particularly, and mostly hydrogen, hydrogen in space. Interesting. Um, okay, a couple, there's a bunch coming in through Facebook. Um, do you think that four limbs and redundant sensory organs such as eyes, ears, etc., would be a typical evolutionary path for alien species? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, for example, why do we have ears? I mean, we have eyes, right? And our eyes are much better than our ears in most cases, you know, by some, some metric. Uh, our hearing is, but on the other hand, our hearing is actually, you know, I should take that back. Our hearing is pretty good. Uh, our smell is not very good, but our hearing and our eyes are both pretty good. But why have both? I mean, heck, you know, if you're going to walk to school, maybe you don't need your ears. Well, think about it the next time the truck comes around the corner. And you won't have seen it, but you may have heard it, right? Or as our ancestors were prone to do, imagine that you're living on the savannas or you're living in the forest. If you're living in a forest, you might not be able to see some giant cat that wants you for lunch, right? You might not be able to see it, but maybe you hear it. So eyes and ears are great things. Smell is a good thing too, because it could tell you about something you can't see, but our smell has uh, been, uh, it, it's not great. <laughs> um, awesome. Uh, Dave Birchall on Facebook um, says, or asks, would ET be a carbon-based life form? Well, it's another good question. I mean, on Star Trek, they were always carbon-based life forms because, you know, Mr. Spock would say, Captain, uh, carbon-based life form on this planet down here. I don't know how he could tell that, but somehow he could. Uh, we're carbon-based not because there's all that carbon, of course. There is a lot of carbon, actually, uh, in the ground. You can go dig out in your backyard, and there'll be a lot of carbon down there. But there's a lot more of other elements, silicon and oxygen. It's called sand or dirt, whatever. <laughs> it's there. But carbon is... You know, and you'll learn about this in uh, ninth grade chemistry. Is it ninth grade or it's 11th grade? Maybe it's 11th grade chemistry. Depends. You know, if you're an advanced student, maybe it's ninth grade. But you'll learn about the fact that carbon has, if you will, handles on it, four handles on it, that want to hook up with other atoms, you know, in particular, things like hydrogen and oxygen and so forth. So carbon can make very complex molecules. And although you probably don't think of it this way, that's what your life is, just a bunch of complex chemistry. And, uh, you know, you wake up in the morning, mom, another day of complex chemistry, which is basically what's going to happen with you. And you, you wouldn't have that complex chemistry if you didn't have carbon. Now, there's some other, there are some other elements, silicon, uh, germanium, tin, lead. They're all, uh, they're, they also have those four hooks, if you will, to lock onto other atoms, but they're not as good at it as carbon is because carbon's the smallest of the atoms that, that has that, uh, that ability. So it doesn't prove that ET will be carbon-based, but if ET is alive, you know, it's probably the better bet to say that it's going to be carbon-based. <laughs> um, what is the likelihood that the recent data on Venus is actually evidence of micro, microbial life forms in the atmosphere? 
Yeah, well, I can't answer that question. Nobody can answer that question. All I can say is the people who came out with that paper two weeks ago, uh, they're in England, they're in other places in Europe, and they're at MIT in the United States. And they're very careful, clever people. And they spend a lot of time. One, one uh, young woman spent, well, I think like four years on her PhD thesis working on this question. And the, the question really boils down to this. The fact that they've claimed to find this funny gas, it's a stinky, smelly gas, actually, uh, in, and, and by the way, also not good for you, in the atmosphere of Venus called phosphine, which, by the way, is just, you know, uh, phosphor with, what is it, three, three uh, hydrogen atoms on it. I think it's pH3. Oh, yeah. They found this thing. Now, one possibility is that they really didn't find it. They only thought they found it. They found it using radio telescopes. But, you know, looking at the paper and all that, it looks to me like it's pretty, pretty convincing that they really did find phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus. So the question boils down to, well, could there be some other way that you could get phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus without there being floating life, right? Because they found the phosphine about 30 miles above the surface. And if you go 30 miles above the surface of Venus, the temperatures are the same as they are, you know, in, uh, in Berkeley, right? They're, they're tolerable temperatures, okay? So, you know, maybe, maybe there's floating life there. There are all sorts of questions about what they eat and all that sort of thing. But all of that, it really doesn't answer the question. We don't know. There is phosphine there, and phosphine on Earth is associated with bacteria, certain kinds of bacteria. So maybe on Venus, they're floating around. But the only way I think we're going to answer this question, there are only two ways we'll be able to finally answer the question here. The one is that you know some other very clever scientists come up with a way to make phosphine that doesn't involve life, and that is terribly probable for Venus, in which case you can say, you know, there's phosphine, but that doesn't, that doesn't prove there's life anymore that the, the, the fact that there's a, you know, I don't know, uh, limestone on the, in the deserts of, of uh, Egypt, that doesn't prove that there are pyramids. You have to actually find a pyramid. So it may be that there's another way to do it, but really, if you want to know whether there's life on Venus, I recommend that you build a rocket ship that goes to Venus, drops through the atmosphere, and samples it all the way down, and then radios back, guess what? There are microbes here. Interesting. Um, this is from Greg Zink. Are we becoming convinced that we are the only ones around who have radio and TV? Well, I don't know what, what you mean by we there, Greg. I mean, you know, I've got radio and TV, but I'm not proud of that. Uh, well, maybe what Greg is saying, are we the only ones that are clever enough to build radios and TVs? And of course, the answer to that is, as far as we know, we are. But that doesn't prove anything. I mean, it's like, you know, my neighbor saying, did you know, Seth, that there could be animals out there that are really big and they have really long noses and they can pick up peanuts, you know, for, for the, uh, a snack. And I would say, that sounds nutty. I, I'm sure that that's not true. I've never seen any animals like that. But that doesn't mean that they're not out there. So it would be surprising to me if humans really are the cleverest things in the uh, universe, which is kind of what you're suggesting there, because uh, the aliens, if they're clever, they can build radios and television and stuff like that. They can build anything that we've been able to build if they're advanced enough, right? I mean, they have the same physics where they live as we have here. So maybe they've done it. Maybe they'll tell us. <laughs> um, what basic elements from the periodic table are needed for life and which can life do without? Yeah, well, you know, there, there are what are, I, I don't even remember what the chinops is it carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. Those are the things that normally make up the majority of what you are. Right? You're basically built out of, you know, like a half dozen elements. But you have a little bit of other things in you too, right? I mean, some of these metals that you probably can't pronounce, I can't pronounce it. Uh, and, and, and other elements, and you know, are they essential to us? You know, iodine, right? You have a little bit of iodine. Is it essential that you have some iodine? Yeah, that's why they put it in your salt to make sure you get enough iodine. And you know, so it's hard to say that life uh, could exist with you know only half the number of elements. But it's not a worry. 
because that's one of the great triumphs of astronomy in the past hundred years, I would say, that we now know that the most distant stars, even the stars in other galaxies, all are made of the same stuff that you find in your high school chemistry lab. The whole universe is built out of the same stuff. So if we've got it, they've got it. I'm really impressed on how you can answer all of these. It's really crazy. Um, this one's, I'm, I, I, I'm like looking for something to stump you. Um, easy. Here's one. Any attempt to use gravitational wave detectors to, to, to pick up non-natural events such as a warp drive technologies? Well, that's an interesting idea. I mean, it may be that uh, the way we find ET is by finding something like an interstellar rocket or something like that, or maybe something really huge that they built. Uh, the thing about gravitational wave detectors is, to begin with, they're, you know, they're, <laughs> they're difficult to build. Anybody who looks into the uh, LIGO instrument will know that they, you, know, you have to have two of them, and, and they're, they're very, very precise things, very difficult to make, but maybe in you know, a thousand years, making a gravitational wave detector will be a high school science fair project. Maybe, I don't know. But would it be a good way to send information around? Would, would the aliens be you know, sending us messages on gravitational waves? And uh, one should never say no when you don't really know, but it's hard to make strong gravitational waves, right? I mean, the ones that we've detected have been because of the collision of giant dead stars or black holes or things like that. And so if you want to send, for example, Morse code for, hi, Bob, I mean, that's not very hard with a radio. But if you're trying to do that by sending gravitational waves, which, by the way, don't go any faster than radio waves, um, it's really hard because you've got to slam some you know, black holes together <laughs> for, for, a, for a half an hour or something like that. So I, I, I think we're going to learn a lot about the universe by doing this, but I don't know that ET will use gravitational waves to communicate. Uh, speaking of black holes, what would happen if you got sucked into a black hole? Well, I mean, you should arrange all your affairs before you allow yourself to, to do that. Uh, make sure you know you, you leave a nice note for your mom, whatever, uh, because we, we do know what happens if you get sucked into a black hole. And by the way, getting sucked into a black hole is actually hard to do. You have to be pretty close to them to get sucked in. There's a giant black hole in the middle of our galaxy. There are giant black holes in the middle of everybody's galaxy. And yet, you know, you're, you're not about to get sucked into them. Uh, but if you did get in, sucked into a black hole, it depends a little bit on how big the black hole is. You might say, what do you mean? They're all the same size. They're all infinitely small. Well, yes, but you know, how much mass is down in there? If it's the most common kind of black hole, the kind that are made when big stars die and blow up, then what happens is that the gravity of the black holes you're falling in uh, pulls on your feet, of course, a little more than it's pulling on your head because your feet are closer to the center of the black hole, right? So what it does is it, you know, it just pulls your shoes off. That's not so bad, but then it pulls your socks off and then it pulls your legs off and then you know, it pulls all your atoms apart. So you get what's called spaghetti thigh which kind of making me hungry. So, you know, that's not good. And it all happens very quickly. I mean, you know, maybe a millionth of a second, something like that. So you don't have to worry about it too much, but it does mean the end of you. And really the bummer of it all is that if you go down to one of these black holes, you know, and, and there are some black holes you could fall into without getting spaghettified if they're big enough. There's no way you can send any information back out. You can't, you know, send a, a, a text to your parents and say, I'm okay, mom. I'm in this black hole, but basically I'm all right. And it's really very interesting. You can't do that. You can't get any information out. So uh, it's really a one way door to, uh, to nowhere. All right, we're getting close. So I think we have time for a few more. Uh, let's see. Do you think humanity will be able to overcome the issue of traveling large distances to be able to make contact with ET? Yeah, good question. Well, I mean, again, you have to be careful not to say, never, we're never going to do it. Or as they say in New York, never happen. Well, I mean, maybe it will happen, but it's hard. It's very hard. 
it isn't because it's difficult to build a fast rocket. You can build a fast rocket. We can build rockets. We have lots of people who know how to build rockets. But if you want to go fast, if you want to go to uh, up to a speed where you could get to the nearest star, say in 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 you know ten years, which is already a pretty long ride, <laughs> ten years, then you have to go something like half the speed of light. And the amount of energy required, which is to say the amount of fuel required, is so enormous that it's a little hard to understand how you could do it. But Fortunately, there is an effect, it's called a special relativity uh, effect, that makes it not too bad for you. If you can go fast enough, then you don't age quite as quickly as you would have back on Earth. So you might, in an extreme case, if your rocket was really fast, you know, only age for an hour. I mean, that's like a flight to LA, right? And, and you could go to the nearest star and only took you an hour. But of course, for the people back on Earth, uh, it would have been four and a half years. So, you know, time isn't the same in all these circumstances. Um, but on the other hand, if your rocket is going very fast, there are other problems. I won't even get into them, except to note that all those little atoms of gas that we were talking about hanging between the stars, well, now they're all coming at your rocket at very high speed. And they're like bullets uh, against your rocket. They'll go right through the skin of the rocket, right through the skin of you, and uh, you'll probably be dead very quickly. I mean, I don't want to discourage anybody, but it's not easy. All right, I think this might be the last one. Uh, we'll see. Is, is it logical or likely to assume that if an alien species overcomes and solves all the problems involved in making contact with us, that they would be more peaceful and evolved in their consciousness because they had to figure them all out? Well, people like to say that. I mean, Carl Sagan, uh, astronomer, many of you might have heard of, some of you, uh, always assumed that the really advanced aliens have gotten beyond all the uh, the problems that you know humans get into all the time, right? war and aggression and you know bad jokes and all that stuff. So maybe, I, personally, I, if they're alive, if they're biological, then I don't believe it because biology always likes to have some small percentage of any given species to be aggressive, right? Because you know if you have a small enough amount. Of, of people or animals or anything that are aggressive, it will work out generally okay for them. You know, society doesn't like it. And if 50% of the population is aggressive, the whole society collapses. But a small percentage being aggressive is okay. That, that's a tolerable situation and it might lead to new kinds of behavior. So, you know, to say, oh, well, don't worry, all the advanced aliens are gonna be peace loving. And if they come to earth, they're just gonna land you know, take out their books of poetry and read them to us, even though I won't appreciate them much. I mean, maybe, maybe, but I, I, don't, I don't bet on that. The only thing that I would say is that it's very, very difficult for anybody to come here, whether it's biological aliens or machine intelligence, it's really hard. So, uh, and, and one more point, they probably don't even know we're here because our radios and uh, radars and television signals haven't gotten very far into space. So it's pretty unlikely that anybody even knows that we're here. So I think you can safely, you know, go to the mall tomorrow, wear your mask, uh, without worrying that aliens are gonna come down and give you a hard time. They don't know you're here. You're, you're getting some fans. So I think, you know, um, your, uh, your show, your radio show, Big Picture Science, you want to do a plug for that? It sounds like some people really want to hear more of you. Well, it's, it's not just my show. I'm the, I have a co-host, Molly Bentley, and she's over in Oakland. Believe it or not, in Oakland. Uh, but you can get that, well, you can get it on the air, but the best thing to do is try and remember the title, Big Picture Science, and just look it up on the internet, and you can listen to shows without having to tune it in on the radio. Well, I, I'm really loving um, how you're really speaking to um, all the generations out there. It sounds really, really awesome um, that everyone's really enjoying sitting with their, their young ones and listening to you. Um, are you still there? I am. I, 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 okay. I had a weird, I had a weird, something weird popped up, but um, uh, Anyway, I just wanted to say thanks, doctor, um, for taking the time. Thanks, SETI, for partnering with us for another awesome episode. I can't wait to see this 
happen again. Um, on the Chabot side, tune in every Friday evening at 8 p.m. for a variety of, uh, of um, uh, things for home, virtual telescopes, and uh, some different uh, other, other upcoming events. Um, so you can check that out at ChabotSpace.org and on our events page. Um, also, check out this uh, SETI.org for a lot more really cool stuff that you'll just learn. Um, your site is amazing. Um, it just really is, is you just start going down some, some awesome rabbit holes. But um, yeah, and you know, both SETI and Chabot definitely need some support and um, to continue all this. And I think, you know, having um, this partnership really is just um, such a really strong thing. I can't wait to see what, what else we come up with. So, you know, keep, keep in tune. Check out the websites, and um, we look forward to sharing more. Again, thanks, uh, thanks a bunch, Seth. Um, that that was just really, really amazing. Well, I was. It was my pleasure, and uh, yeah, I hope uh, to give some of the people, particularly the younger people, something to think about. Yeah. So, um, if you're out there, uh, stay tuned. Check. Uh, we're we're really excited to do more and have a good evening. And we look forward to coming back again with some really exciting stuff. Everyone for joining.